Hello, you are very welcome back to Bookster Talks. I am joined by the wonderful Natalie Molina Nino and Ireland Hamilton. You're both very welcome here this evening or afternoon. Perhaps it's the afternoon for you at the moment. Just barely. Thank you. <laughs> Whatever time of day it is, you're all very welcome to be here. Um, just so our audience does know, we are going to take some questions in the comments whenever you guys can think of anything you want to pop in. I'm going to ask Natalie and Ireland just to pop anything that they need to post on their own socials to make sure everybody can be here. And while they do that, I would love to tell you all a little bit more about them. So we have Natalie Molina Nino, who's an entrepreneur, builder capitalist at O3 and tech globalization veteran, focused on high growth businesses that benefit women and the planet. She's the author of Leapfrog, The New Revolution for Women Entrepreneurs, and serves as a venture partner at Connectivity Capital Partners. Molina Nino launched her first tech startup at the age of 20 and is the co-founder of Entrepreneurs at Athena at the Athena Centre for Leadership Studies at Barnard College at Columbia University. She spent 15 years advising organisations such as Disney, Microsoft, MTV, Mattel and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. During that time, she co-led the launch and growth of a multinational technology globalisation business with Lionsbridge into a $100 million or operation in 30 plus countries. Molina Nino advises the Walkstar Fund, Full Cycle and Blue IO. She serves on the advisory board of the National Institute for Reproductive Health, We NYC Women Entrepreneurs of NYC, and Vote Run Lead. Was honored for Schnepp's inaugural Women of the Wall Street or Women of the Women of Wall Street inaugurations. Now, a moment. Um, apologies for her influence in banking and finance, and was named among People's Magazine's 2019 Most Powerful Latinas. Prior to founding her previous venture, Brav Investments, Melina Nino launched Nelly Galan's education venture, Self Made, and stepped in as CRO of Power to Fly, the fastest growing hiring platform for women in tech and beyond. Which is an incredible like list of things I should to have under your belt. You, you, you apologize for getting stuck in the middle. I feel like I should apologize for the length. Jesus, thank you. <laughs> Not at all. Sometimes these words are just a, it's too impressed to get my words out. Uh, we also have the wonderful Ireland Hamilton, who is the founder and managing partner of Backstage Capital, a venture capital firm dedicated to minimizing funding disparities in tech by investing in high potential founders who are people of color, women, and or LGBT. Started from scratch in 2015, Backstage has now raised nearly $12 million and invested in more than 130 startup companies led by underestimated founders. In 2018, Ireland co-founded Backstage Studio, which launched four accelerator programs in Los Angeles, Detroit, Philadelphia and London, UK. In October 2018, Ireland was featured on the cover of Fast Company magazine as the first black woman non-celebrity to do so. Ireland and Backstage were the subject of season seven of the popular podcast Startup from Gimlet Media. Ireland is the author of It's About Damn Time and host of the weekly podcast, Your First Million. In 2019, Ireland and her mother, Miss Erlene Butler-Sims, announced their new scholarship programme, which kicked off with Oxford University's first ever undergraduate scholarship for a Black student, as well as a full-ride scholarship for a psychology student at Mrs. Sims' alma mater, HBCU Dillard University. That is, I don't even know where to begin with both of your amazing achievements. So I will ask you both to launch into so many amazing things that you have done and accomplished and written about and experienced. So I would love to hear a bit more about any of those things. So <laughs> they are going to speak to us about a lot of their ventures and their books. And we will take, as I say, questions from the audience as well. So be sure to pop them down below. Arling, shall I start? First question? Sure, go, go for it. Awesome. Well, good. Thank you for, for agreeing um, to join me. Uh, when I heard about Bookster and the community at Bookster and just the whole team, um, I was like, we should give them a, a good solid conversation. Um, so the first thing I thought of is actually, because I actually didn't know that piece of the bio about Dillard, I knew about the Oxford scholarship. Um, and so maybe, first of all, that's amazing. Um, I would love to use that and piggyback off of something else connected to your mom, which is, um, there is a part at the tail end of your book um, where you quote your mom, who I think is also quoting maybe a, a, a Chinese proverb, possibly. Yes. Um, we, that think says, that's, we think that's what she's doing. Think. I'm not sure where it came from, but she's certainly <laughs> quoting something. Something. Um, but either way, it was beautiful. And it's this uh, phrase of the seed um, doesn't see the petal. Um, and I, I wanted to start with that just because um, to acknowledge, you know, we're on the last day of July in 2020, we're in the middle of a pandemic and a massive economic crisis. Um, it's hard not to acknowledge all of that. We had a, a death in my family in May. Um, 
and uh, a lot of sort of family and heritage and things have popped up. And so anything related to like family, I think maybe I'm, uh, I'm latching onto a little bit more. But first, I loved that phrase. But second, it also is very similar to something that I actually have tattooed on my spine, which is um, a, the design of a, con of a condor. Because mm -hmm. in Incan mythology, which is where uh, some of my heritage is from, um, the Native Americans in the Andes believed that around the time of your and my generation, so you know we're close, I think, to the same age, um, there, is this, there was this generation that would be born that would travel a bunch, leave the sort of family unit, you know, and go away, learn a bunch of languages, do a bunch of like this idea that like they would go out into the world and their entire job, the condor generation was to lay the groundwork for what was coming next in the generations after that. Hmm. Um, and it's a little connected to like, not dissimilar to the Mayan calendar and the 2012 and the idea that like it was the end of an era and like the new era begins. Um, anyway, I say all of that to just say, that's why that thing your mom said was just like pfft, sucker punch for me. Um, and <laughs> yeah. I wanted to start with that. Like, it, I know I'm starting at the end, um, but it was just such a beautiful part of your book. Can you tell us something about that? Sure. And I, I didn't know anything about that, that other, you know, uh, what you've mentioned with Mayans. Um, I have to do more research. I, there's so much I need to learn and, and understand about people. Uh, I love that, that. I'll never, I'll never know enough uh, about other people and their cultures. And that sounds pretty cool. Um, originally, my mom said this to me while, so we were on a road trip, probably 2017, mm. most, I believe. And she had, um, we, we, we had reason to believe she, was, she didn't have much more time with us, right? Mm. Just in general at, at the time. And we were on this road trip because she wanted to see, she had set on this goal to see all 50 states. Mm -hmm. That was her goal. And she was, she's really close. I mean, she, I think she has like 10 or something to go at this point. But wow. when we were on this road trip, I, I had volunteered to for a week kind of work from the road and, and take her to four or five states. Cause her goal, her rule was she had to at least spend one night at each of these states. Mm. Okay. So we were kind of in the middle of nowhere um, and it was beautiful and everything. And she says that to me um, because she was talking about how she was proud of me and mm -hmm. that she's not going to be able to see everything that comes from what, I, what I'm working on with backstage, with the, with the investment firm, with catalyzing people. So at the time I'm driving and she says it and I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> this is the time to say this to me because I'm like and I'm driving through tears and it's this whole thing um and then and then thankfully so it's a little bit convoluted but uh, thankfully the thing we thought was the issue before was not the issue however very quickly after unfortunately she was diagnosed with cancer so which is okay now so we we've just kind of gone through these different things where you know and since when she when she went in for her surgery in 2018 for cancer mm -hmm. and she you know she was going under as a very she's would have been almost 70 at the time just mm -hmm. a month away and it was a very like um how do I put it um it was it was a moment where we didn't know what was going to happen obviously risky and, any surgery yeah, yeah any that, surgery yeah. exactly and and so she she, 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 she's good, right? So she gave both my brother and I a handwritten letter that was only to be read by us in individually, not to be shared with each other or with anyone else. And, and we played, um, and again, I have to re reiterate, she is doing fine. She went flying colors. She's doing magnificently now, but she, she, she played the certain song that she wanted to play and it was her message to us. And I, I could cry thinking about it, but it was just so she had prepared us both in such a beautiful way that I believe I understand her, you know, I understand her now. And it's actually a huge gift. It's a huge mm. gift. It, it caused me to do the same. I mean, it, mm. it's a little tough to talk about, but I then went and I put my will together and I put mm -hmm. what I wanted to happen. I'll be 40 this year. And I put together some things and it actually made me feel 
good. It made me feel like, okay, people are going to know what I need to happen if anything happens and everybody yeah. will be taken care of. And, you know, it was, it was actually quite peaceful. Mm. Um, and so I think, you know, now when I think about that phrase, I just think about it for my, I think about it, she was saying it to me for that reason, but I think about it for myself and for others who are like our age and like, as you said, who are doing this work today, that I think there is a peace and a confidence and understanding that everything we do today is not necessarily going to pay off for us today. It's not necessarily going to be something that we understand the magnitude and the impact of, but if we understand and believe that some people at some point will be benefited from it, just like we are benefited from the work that our ancestors and predecessors put into place. Yeah. That gives you some, a, a different meaning to life, I think. It's crazy that you're, it's not crazy, it's crazy <laughs> timely that you were saying that also on the day when we're all blessed with the words of Congressman John Lewis, mm -hmm. right, who got to see some of the fruits of his labor, but will never see most he never will and i had him and i had his image in my mind at the end of that statement actually um okay. so he got to see a great deal of it and that's yeah. been that's been fantastic because um he could have he could have be, been a some obscure figure that we just read about every once in a while but yeah. he just kept going and going and going and going and and reiterating and staying the course and never leaving never straying from his core message i think that's a good uh lesson for us all too yeah yeah he he never he never took the foot off the gas it seems like um what have you got i'm happy i have more questions and thoughts but <laughs> i don't want to drive yeah. only well um you know i i was very grateful to be part of uh your your book leapfrog Ugh. and uh which is right behind you why such you, why an honor Oh, okay. I just laugh. It was just such an honor, um, but it was one of those things where my co-writer and I were so enamored with all aspects of your story that it actually took some discipline to be like, okay, we can't put Arlen in the book eight times. Uh, we've <laughs> got to leave room for some so other. I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I saw. I was like, yeah, and it was before I had a book or even had a book deal, and so I was just so. I was so. Um, I, I, my mom may have wallpapered her her home. <laughs> you know? I was, it was, it was cool. so awesome. Yeah, it was super cool. And um, I, I just kind of wondered, like author to author now, um, mm -hmm. how, how, how was that experience for you even just putting that together and like, having that out in the world, I think is like, because you're, you're a few steps ahead of me. So it's be interesting yeah. how you feel about it today. I mean, some of it's probably really similar to what you felt when your story just started to get out there, right? Um, through all the different media channels, it's a little weird to come up to perfect strangers or to have a perfect stranger send you something and be like, yeah, this is like similar to when you got, you know, cervical cancer. And I was like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, that's a story I had never told publicly. I included it in the book reluctantly. My co-writer was really adamant that I included it in the book. And maybe because of my own way of dealing with things, I try not to think about that. Yeah. <laughs> and then like, it'll come up and I'll remember. I'm like, right, that's in a book it's published it's out there um so that's you know that's always uh something that i think i'm i'm getting used to but the other thing that i love um is just that it seems to have taken the sort of trajectory that i was really hoping for you never know right mm. what's going to happen when something gets put out in the world but i um i worked with a black agency which is where my literary agent is um joy Tatella, who's an amazing human being Partly because Joy's wonderful, but partly because the Black Agency represents Julia Cameron, who wrote The Artist's Way. Mm -hmm. And I love the way that The Artist's Way has a little bit of a cult following, right? If you're not in the creative world, you might never have heard of it. Mm -hmm. But if you are, it's got this cult following. It's like people's Bible and they did classes and they do all these things. And so I, I mentioned that just because I was really hoping that of all the different trajectories a book could take, that mine would follow down the path of something approximating that, right? Yeah. Where it's like, if you if it's not for you, you've never heard of it and that's fine. If it's for you, you hold it on your heart and you show it to your friends and there's something sort of really emotionally connected about it um, that you feel like you wanna pass it on. And I see a lot of that and it's funny, like 
communities will just discover it a year, year and a half now, two years later, and they'll start a book club like it just launched today. And it's like, no, but they just discovered it and it's still relevant and, and it still moves people and hopefully it helps them. And, and I love it, you know, and I love that some people um, like you, I think you were already starting to be known, but I hope that I introduced you to new audiences. And then there were other people who were, you know, more widely known, um, but nobody knew these stories. And so, you know, there's over 60 of you profiled in the book and it makes me really proud to think that it wasn't just tips. It wasn't just my story, but it was a vehicle to tell a bunch of other people's stories, people who like, I just think, you know, the world needs to know about and learn from. So, yeah, I'm excited about, um, I've been talking to, you know, obviously talking to a lot of authors in the last nine months, just to kind of pick, pick their brain, the thing that we hate saying. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm excited about what kind of seems mundane to them maybe it will for us at some point but this mm. part of like people are they, they say you know eight years later somebody will just discover it in an airport or a, or a, you know at the friend's house or something they say mm -hmm. it's sort of like mo most of these authors are saying it's sort of like you know I'm, I've moved on so it's not oh as, right but I look at that as like oh my goodness like how cool is that that like we're reading books that were put out decades centuries ago and totally. it's just the most exciting to me that is the most exciting part because there, of course mm -hmm. there are going to be some things that you look at and you read and you're like oh that's what, what are they talking about that is so uh archaic and you know it has nothing to do with the real world now but there's so many things that will always be true and always mm -hmm. resonate and that 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 excites me yeah i think i thought about that because there's a story in the end for me about an invitation that I got to participate in something with the State Department that involved a member of the current White House administration. Um, and I tell the story about how I said, you know, absolutely not. And I quoted uh, Harold Pinter, the playwright, the Nobel Prize winning playwright and said, um, thank you the, for the invitation, but I would rather die. Um, <laughs> and, and it's like, I can see how in the future people, you know, the, the Trump administration hopefully will be, you know, some really dark time in our history and all of that. But mm. and so I debated, I'm like, that's very much of the current moment. Is it too much of the current moment that you kind of want to make it more evergreen type of content? But mm. it's the truth and it's, the truth. it's still funny. And, you know, yeah. Harold Pinter quoting him is never going to, you know, stop being hilarious. So. <laughs> um, I know uh, that we could go on and on, but I, I also know that there was going to be a moment where we we're going to open it up to questions. So you tell us, Bookster team. And well, I do. I mean, there's some really, really awesome questions coming in here. But what uh, there's one wonderful comment from Jackie who says, "Wow, this is incredible about the con generation and Mayan predictions on this time. Definitely mm -hmm. a new era." Just to reflect mm -hmm. on that, because that's obviously a huge part. Um, I did have a question here from David who had asked for both of you. It's a kind of a question that could go fork out in both ways here. Um, what are the most common obstacles that you've come across in your career thus far? Which is obviously a meaty question, but um, you you say know, common, you the, the common ones we have in common is that the question? No, it's in like what's the most common one that you've come across yourself? Mm -mm, both, both it's not one that you share, but just the biggest obstacle that you've kind of both realized has been happening. Um, oh, that happens everything. over and over again for one of us. Yeah. Okay, I had to yeah. understand that. Okay. I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, I'm happy to go first. Um, I would say. It's, uh, it's one that I would have said is not that big of an issue maybe a couple of years ago, because I think that we, I can't speak for anybody else. I believed, and maybe I go through cycles, that there is a point in your life where you graduate out of certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, and I love this. Uh, I know this isn't, I'm not answering for Arlen, but I was reminded of this as I was reading Arlen's book about you know, here she is on the cover of Fast Company. She's upgraded to a fabulous suite at the hotel uh, where she's going to speak at this Forbes conference. And then she gets mistaken. Somebody uh, decides to mistake her for housekeeping staff. Um, and I was reminded recently, um, different example, but um, that I had brought in somebody to co-invest with me um, and in a situation where we were peers. Um, and again, I'm sort of feeling in my head, like I've graduated now from, I'm, I'm no longer a founder asking for money to an investor. So that power dynamic is not there, right? I'm now working with somebody who's a peer. I think that that means that I'm free of certain things. 
that are just not going to pop up, right? And sure enough, during the course of this conversation, um, I bring in the founders of this company, this, this deal that I'm introducing to my co-investor to, um, and they're doing the thing that you do, getting to know the founders and asking them questions. Um, and some, at some point during the course of the conversation, I get asked what my background is and to submit my resume and specifically to tell them what my educational background is, mm-hmm. like where I went to college. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of just didn't think about it. And I, I was like, that's a weird question, but I, I kind of you know rolled with it and, and didn't give it too much importance. And it was afterwards with the founders that the CEO said to me, that was incredibly offensive. You know, Do you really think that if they were talking, in this case, it was an older white guy, you think that if he was talking to a co-investor, a peer of his who was white and older, um, that he would have asked him to submit his resume and to understand where he went to college. And it, it was one of and, those things and where- And in front of other founders. And in front of other founders. Yeah. And I, I have to say two observations. One is I can't believe that I'm still dealing with this sort of shit. Sorry, my French. But two, I also realized if I'm a little bit, uh, if I turn the camera on me, right? And just am self-aware with me, I have perhaps been conditioned to tolerate that sort of behavior. And I think I'm fairly good at standing up for myself, but I didn't even notice it. It wasn't until the founder pointed it out to me that that was absurd, that Mm -hmm. I realized it really was. And I'm so used to just rolling with those kinds of things that I didn't even let it sort of stop me. And I certainly didn't really call it out. Um, So anyway, that's my long-winded way of saying, um, I felt like, it was a bit of a wake up call in that I had gotten comfortable and I forgot that these things are gonna just keep surfacing. And some of my mentors who are 60, 70, 80 years old, when that happened, came back to me and they were like, it never stops, Natalie. You gotta keep keep mm-hmm. asserting yourself and keep those eyes open. Yeah, you have to, um, it, it's a testament to how often it happens that we're so, it, it just, rolls off our back but not even so it's not like we're accepting it it's just we didn't even notice it because we're protecting ourselves from all of that trauma that happens over and over and over again uh and in my way the way that I handle a lot of that is humor because it is it just becomes like it's the absurd thing you know it's just like right now I have a plan to release a a quick video uh later today that will Mm -hmm. address people who have found their way into my dms very much so believing that my time is theirs Mm. and vice versa. And I've had a couple of times just in the last week where two men asked me to speak somewhere. I had the nerve, the nerve (laughs) to send them to my speaking agent, which is their job. If I I saw one of those that you posted on Twitter, I was. There's a second one happened today. I was just made aware of a second one where they apparently we're very upset (laughs) that I had the nerve to do that. So I'm just going to release a video that explains um, what we're not going to do and what's not going to come into my DMs anymore. But that's, that's, you know, something, I think uh, another thing that I kind of happens over and over again that I've noticed is, is this like, uh, maybe we all feel this way. I don't know, but like, uh, I always feel like I'm a couple of years ahead of the ahead of the curve you know and and the thing that the I'm curve of about, abuse or of innovation no, 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 or both? separate topic separate topic <laughs> oh, okay. okay to answer the question about what I find like a common challenge or obstacle mm-hmm. is that a lot of times I find myself d- describing things explaining things to people all all backgrounds mm-hmm. that only two three four years later do they do that does it make sense in the right. world does it make mm-hmm. does it I'll look around and say, well, I've been saying that for five years. I've been saying that for nine years. I've been saying that for two years and multiple Mm -hmm. topics. And so that feels challenging because it's just like a constant feedback from people that, um, that you're kind of out there. And so I've gotten used to that too, and, and, and almost embrace it at this point, but that's definitely been from, since I was a child, I was always a little, so all through my adult life, it's always been that it's like, Mm -hmm. I'm and in, it's like a, the, the challenge is in kind of melding the two worlds. Like I can yeah. think about the future, I can visualize the future, but I do need to be able to articulate how that applies today yeah. and, and, and get somebody with, take somebody with me. It needs to be 
I think that's always like the inner work and the outer work too, right? Like, yes, I'm sure there's work that you have to do, but also I think that we need to create a frame and a, and a context where people are ready to receive that. Like when people talk about like, you know, training women to become leaders, it's like, yeah, but we have to create a society where people know how to even deal with a woman who leads, right? And I think like in what you're saying, what's interesting about that is that, um, you know, there's some really good research that talks about even words that get used to describe men who are, for example, ahead of their time, right? They're mm -hmm. mavericks, they're geniuses, they're all, <laughs> and those words don't get to, don't tend to be used oh, and no. applied to women, much less women of color. And I think that there's also that, right? Like you're, you're ahead of the curve and that's seen as a weird anomaly, right? Mm -hmm. A thing that doesn't fit in the puzzle, an outlier versus the exact same thing happening to somebody where people give them the benefit of the doubt and say, well, yep. you know, that's really innovative. I've never heard yeah. anything like that. Nobody's saying what he just said. He must know something I don't know, right? And that whew, benefit of the yeah. doubt doesn't seem to be given um, to someone. It's not even given in real time next to the person, like next to someone else, you know, it's not even given a lot of times in real time where I, I could be doing, I could be running my company a certain way and point to someone else who's doing that in a different field, but the same way. And right. they're uh, considered, you know, a genius and, you know, and this and that, it could be even younger than me, but they're a white man. And I'm, I have something in mind, you know, I wouldn't say what it was, but it, it's like, they're doing exactly what I'm doing that I'm being questioned about, mm -hmm. that I'm being uh, not trusted with the ability to, to pull off. And it's, it's and, just very interesting. And I can imagine, you know, with both of your books that a lot of the inspiration and stuff that to make those books come about, you would have pulled from those challenges and experiences. But I did have a question from somebody named Anna who says, what were other books that inspired you? Were there other books or literature that kind of inspired your own writing or, you know, beyond your challenges and experiences that you had yourselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I love, I, I read mostly uh, biographies and nonfiction. That's like the main thing that I can, that I get through. And um, so for me, I wasn't, it wasn't necessarily that it, um, that it, it influ influenced the way I wrote. Maybe even I did the opposite of these things, but um, mm -hmm. I really liked reading books by people like Brad Feld and uh, Richard Branson was a, when it came to books I, I really liked his um, sort of style of sharing his life with you as as part of it like you're part of the it's like a reality show but it's he has all the control of it you know it's whatever he wants you to think his life was or what he is thinking and it was very um, his all of his work has been obviously it's you know, co-writers and heavily, you know, helped, but all of it has seemed to be very um, transparent and letting you into his thoughts and very conversational. And I like that a lot. And um, um, yeah, th there were thankfully, I mean, a lot of people um, on this shelf and, and, and beyond um, had, had books that were either just out or were in the process. And so just talking to other authors was very helpful too. Hmm. Uh, something that people don't know about my book is that it was going to be in a much more traditional format. Um, and it's funny because think about the dates of this, right? This is prior to me to, this is prior to Time's Up in like 2015, as we're in the process of selling the book. Um, there was this concern that maybe this whole women's empowerment, which is not a term that I use, um, genre had maxed out. <laughs> <laughs> and so and so how are we yeah. going to differentiate right and make sure that it doesn't just look like another thing that's already out there and because um, there's a one book that came out is that what they're saying because one book like by one what person? was Amor Sophia Amorosa says right there were like a couple there were a few yeah um, it was lean in and, and and girl boss what that's maxed out that's funny and so funny the feedback was like, how do we differentiate? And then my agent sent me, and I actually already knew this book, but I don't think I owned it, but she physically sent it to me. And it was rework by the guys yeah. over at 37 Signals, Yeah. right? And every, it's like, they, they had little, uh, they didn't call them hacks, but they were little tidbits that were like two, yeah. three pages long in a cartoon, right? Yeah. Um, and she was like, I'm not proposing that we change your content. I'm not proposing that we change any of the material that's in there, but I am proposing that could we chunk it up into something like this? Yeah. And I was like, if you're, if it's structure and if you think that this structure is going to sell or, you know, it's going to um, be more likely to be 
um, to have traction as long as, you know, I'm saying what I need to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. and so that's what we did. And, um, and I love those guys, like generally speaking, you know, the ethos behind Basecamp and the way that David Hen- Henemir Hansen and those guys build businesses. And if you're not familiar with them, 37 Signals is more than just a firm that develops software. They do a lot to impact um, culture in, a, in an industry that is incredibly toxic. They're one of the few people that are out there kind of doing really non-toxic, more thoughtful things. Um, and I love that not only did I go with that structure and I was inspired by their structure, but it was a structure that happened to be, you know, coming from a group that I have a lot of respect for. So mm-hmm. that was one. Mm-hmm. And on a similar vein, kind of alongside your books and things here, Kensley asks, what is the number one message that both of you would want women to take away from reading each of your books? Mm. Which I can I imagine can be hard to encapsulate into one message, but you know, what's the kind of main idea that you want people to take away from it? I think mine might be easier since it's newer like newer so it's fresher on the mind of like what I was hoping to put out there um miss assumption but I just if nothing else I want people women to take away the I the understanding that it any of this and all of this is theirs for the taking uh, equally you know mm-hmm. and I think I meet so many people of all ages so many women of all ages Hmm. And so many people of color of all ages who are still seeking permission, still seeking, don't want to rock the boat, don't want to take, take up too much space. And what I, what I hope people get from my book is that you've already inherited that space. You Hmm. just have to claim it, you know? I love that. That's, I don't, this is not my answer, but I just want to piggyback off of that. There's an Afro-Latina poet who I love named Ariana Brown, who recently said, if you are alive today, you are descended from a people who refuse to die, mm-hmm. um, which I love. It reminds yeah. me of what you just said. Um, from my perspective, I would say um, a story that's not in the book, but it's the truth about how the book came out was that I wanted the word shortcut in the title or somewhere on the cover of the book, mm. because ultimately it's 50 shortcuts. Um, but we call them hacks and we didn't put the word shortcut in the cover of the book because we tested it and the tested, the tests resulted in people having a really negative reaction to the word shortcut. Hmm. Um, and the word that they most associated with the word shortcut was cheating. Um, and I guess if I wanted people to walk away with one thing, it is because the book is full of examples of this, that, you know, the people who have all the capital, the influence, and the power today um, largely got there because of shortcuts, right? The president of the United States got millions of dollars from his family to start his first business. Um, even if you're not all conscious. Of his yeah, all of his business. <laughs> exactly. Um, even if you're not conscious of your shortcut, even if your shortcut was just that you weren't born on the south side of Chicago, you were born in Beverly Hills, right? Those are still, at the end of the day, shortcuts that helps people get to where they got. And what I would say to people, if you leave with one thing, that is that I've given you 50 and you can come up with 50,000 more um, ways to make and craft your own shortcuts because the traditional prescribed way of doing things was not designed for us to thrive. And so not only is there no shame in figuring out your own shortcuts, for making up for all the lost time and all of the obstacles that were put in front of our ancestors. But it's actually your job to do that. The next generations need you to do that. Um, Just in the case of gender, it's gonna take, according to the World Economic Forum, like 170 years just to get to gender parity. None of us has 170 years. And the only way we shrink that timeline is by embracing this idea of of the shortcut or in the case of what we ultimately call them, right? The hack. The, um, the hard part of, you know, being on, you know, conversations like this is not being able to take notes for myself. <laughs> like, wow, this is, I, can't, I can't take note of this. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have the question here from Michael. Now, this one is probably a little bit more um, leaning towards Natalie because I know that Full Cycle is a venture of yours. Um, but it does kind of open up a question of, I'll, I'll read the question first. Michael says, hey, I'm wondering, since Full Cycle is dedicated to having private capital intervene with the climate crisis, are there other social issues that are at the heart of any of your ventures? Yeah. 
Um, and I actually think that applies to both of us since both of us of really um, invest always with a lens like this. Um, my investing happens to be at the intersection of gender and uh, climate. And so everything I touch is going to be touching one of those two areas. Um, and when I say gender, I want to be really clear because I think sometimes coded language gets used. And when I first entered the space, and this was um, possibly, you know, before a lot of the amazing Black and Latina and other women of color entered the space, um, what I saw in the gender lens investing space was that gender was really just coded language for a lot of white ladies investing in only a lot of white ladies. Um, that was a problem for me. And so I just want to be really clear um, when I say investing in gender, I definitely, and also because I'm an engineer um, and I'm pretty good at math, um, I mean women of color leading that because eight out of every, sorry, women are starting more businesses. Um, in fact, I think they're starting them at the rate of like twice the rate of men in the United States. And of those businesses, 8.9 out of 10 are started by women of color. So in my view, if you are doing investing with gender at all as a lens, then if you're good at math, that better mean 89% of your focus is women of color because that's just the math. Um, and so for, for me, full cycle is a part of that, right? It's, it's at that intersection. The founder of the full cycle fund, my friend Ibrahim Al Husseini, understands really clearly that women um, are key to any climate change solution. Um, and so, yeah, that's how those two kind of connect. Everything I touch will touch one of those two lenses. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm pretty, pretty focused um, and aligned with anything that I work on right now is, is, and for the foreseeable future, I don't, I, I want to spend the rest of my life working on this until, of course, I mean, what would be great would be to be made obsolete, but um, I focus on women, people of color, LGBTQ um, more and more. Uh, being very specifically, you know, specific and saying black people, people of color, LGBTQ, um, women. Um, and I originally started with women across the board because I, I saw so much inequity, uh, just to, and it didn't matter what woman you were. Um, and more and more, I think um, resources need to, to be really deployed right now to women of color, black women, um, and I'll, so I'll, I'll do that for the rest of my life. And the way I've been doing it the last few years has been through investing directly into startup companies. And um, more recently, so I was able to do about 140 of those in the last few years at um, kind of their pivotal moments for, for a lot of them, either the first check or uh, a check to keep them in business or things like that. And then um, I have also started investing directly into funds that are uh, by, by the same types of emerging managers in, in most cases um, or and or investing in, in that um, group. And in some cases, their first check because I know a lot of times it's hard to get these types of funds off the ground because people don't, I know from firsthand experience, people don't understand it uh, in time. And so uh, that's been really rewarding and I, I think I'll keep doubling down on that over time. I think that's something that's really important just to mention is that both, uh, so Full Cycle is a fund. It's a Palestinian founder. Um, you know, the other one, um, Connectivity Capital, Capital um, the principal that I'm most familiar with and I've worked the most with is Denmark West. You know, it's a, it's a black owned fund. Um, the reason that I think, and I don't want to put words into your mouth, Arlen, but I think that we've both kind of concluded that once you realize that the startups and the, the companies and the businesses that need investing um, are there and, and they've been very well researched, then there is the problem that's sort of more at the root of it, which is that in order to make sure that more and more of that capital is going into the hands that we want it to, then the people writing the check need to be from the communities that we're targeting, right? We need to have more of those black investors and Latino investors and so on. And so at least for me in realizing that that's why some of the effort then became, okay, well, how do we support those up and coming investors, right? Exactly. It's a lot of impact that way. And speaking of impact, there's a lovely comment from Kat here who says, yes, resources need to be deployed to women of color. Thank you both for all that you do. But, but you're, awesome. There's an Thank impact you. right there in the comments Thanks, alone. Kat. Um, <laughs> I have another question here from Austin who says, what are some of the goals that you have in mind that you want to achieve? So, I mean, you had both touched on that kind of with your, your goals. 
I'm happy to start. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I had a dream recently because I was involved um, trying to interject myself into the process of trying to fix the recent federal stimulus, working with congressional leaders and some Senate leaders because the CARES Act was such a abject failure, right? And it locked out millions and millions of black and brown owned Main Street businesses. And so I've been working and I've been writing op-eds and I've been on TV a lot talking about this. Um, um, Arlen, I know also interjected and, and lent a hand there. Um, but one of the things that I was doing in the background was we were pre-qualifying loans. P these are called PPP loans. They're basically federal stimulus loans that were designed to help small businesses. But again, they were locking out black and brown businesses. And so I was helping them get their loans, um, their applications completed. And then through back channels at banks, that were excluding them, but because I had a friend or I knew somebody, we were basically sneaking them in and we were able to process a few hundred of them. And, and um, it took up a lot of my time, but around that time, I had a dream that hopefully answers this question. My goal largely was this dream that I had during the course of like not sleeping that month in April, which was that I want us to get to the point where one day in the not too distant future, communities of color um, and our accomplices um, can wake up and say, I'm moving my credit card to a consumer bank that is Black, Indigenous, people of color owned. I'm moving my mortgage to a company that is owned by communities of color. I'm moving my pension, my retirement fund. Um, I'm going to do my groceries, you know, at a Native American owned grocery store, like just down the line where somebody could wake up and very easily, without much friction, say, I'm taking every single dollar that I touch and I'm going to put it within communities that I want to support. Because if we do that, uh, my team's research um, dug up that if we were to do that, the communities of color in the United States alone have buying power of $3.9 trillion. If we did that, we would be the fourth largest economy of any country in the world if we just shopped with ourselves and supported ourselves um, as a community, as a large, you know, sort of united community. And so that's, that's my dream. I don't know how long it's going to take to build that. I don't know how necessarily, although I'm starting to build the basic building blocks, but that's, it's a, it's a big goal, but that's it. That's the dream. Mm. Um, mine, my overall dream and, and desire is to catalyze people who have the dream you have, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like to be, to be someone who can um, just and help you go through so you don't have to worry about what your resume looks like and you don't have to worry about answering questions from people who don't understand and all of that to get to the point where and wherever it, it may be and it's across several different uh, mechanisms because it's not going to all be in venture like for certainly won't all be in venture but across all boards be able to say okay through capital through resources through conviction through connection um, through high, uh, amplification, all of that. How do we make those things possible so that your, your path to getting there is made less uh, burdensome? I feel like a big part of how we do that is by doing a lot of the work that Arlen's been doing so well, which is to change the narrative, right? Mm -hmm. And um, whether that's her putting her story out there, um, or the work that I think we both do to amplify other people's stories, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exercise of repetition. Like yep. this is what genius looks like. This is what success looks like. Mm -hmm. This is what inspiration, this is what winning looks like. Um, you know, very different story than what we typically hear. If you looked at the covers of all the business magazines and all of the articles and everything, you would think that there would be, that, that it wasn't 89% of all women-owned businesses or women of color, right? Like you, you mm -hmm. would think that we, people who look like us and maybe who have backgrounds like us, um, you would think that we were the outliers and the exceptions, but when you look at the data, we're actually the majority and we mm -hmm. actually shouldn't just be a part of the narrative in business and in the world. We should be dominating. Stories like ours should be dominating the narrative. Yeah. Um, and that's not happening yet. And I, I'm really glad that everything that Arlen does and everything that I try to do is, is really um, helpful, I think, in changing that narrative a little bit and that's, little. that's one of those things that people are just not going to understand for the most part until it's it's ubiquitous and then there's someone's going to say one day well how did that happen well it was a lot of work that was and thought that was put into it, a lot of strategy that was put in it not everything that meets the eye is what's going on 
You know, not every tweet and every article is what's <laughs> really going on. You're seeing, it's almost like stars. Like mm -hmm. the things that you see as a group online, that's or the headline is really just years of work meeting the eye and yeah. everything else is in play. So uh, I'm looking forward to that too, what we will see, you know, and the rest of it, you, you may not. Yeah. And I do think it requires unity because um, some real talk here, I'm, we've both received criticism and we've both mm -hmm. been, you know, um, received critically in different contexts for different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I remember being uh, at a cocktail one night and having somebody say that, you know, saying not great things about Arlen and that she's taking all the oxygen and people are going to think that that's what it means to be a, you know, an investor as a woman of color. And, you know, my response was, so why don't you stand up and take some of your own oxygen? You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's room here for multiple stories. You yeah. don't like hers? Tell your own, be loud. You get on, you know, a cover of a magazine too. Like, you know, we yeah. sometimes believe that <laughs> there I, is I say. one, you know, room for one. Sorry, yeah. Arlen, what were you saying? No, that's what I say to people two who have that who have the well I don't say it to most you know I don't have time to say it to most you know like it's just, <laughs> um but it it really is like you know some, sometimes I will hear that I'll hear that kind of through back channels and I'll and I'll think about sp specific people who are saying it in some cases I've kind of been able to directly find a line where I'm the reason they have the job they have because of this call or this thing that happened behind the scenes yeah and they don't know that you know because I get a lot of people who reach out to me and, and ask I mean all day long ask me to do things and I will just quietly say take it to this person take it to that person give this to them to them we have teams and, to do that I don't know yeah. if you're like I have people on my team whose job it is just to be like we're, we don't have time to respond to this email but go ahead and flag this deck or send this thing yeah. to such and such person. And the person might never yeah. know that that happened. Yeah. It's not my business to get credit. It's our business to amplify. Yeah. But that's okay. I mean, I heard a, a statistic at some point. I don't remember. I think it was like in a marketing book. Um, so I don't know if it's real or not, but I heard a statistic that if like the boldest, the boldest ideas, the boldest uh, campaigns have a, a kind of an average of 15% negative feedback, like naysayers. Mm -hmm. And if you aren't getting 15% negative feedback, you're not going big enough. So it, it might have been something just said to placate and, and make me feel better. But I just really, <laughs> I mean, they weren't saying I was reading it, you know, I just really remembered that when I ever anytime I see a negative thing about me, I'm just like, okay, 15%. I wonder where we're at. We have seven yet. <laughs> Let me go bigger. Yeah. Let me go. Let me go harder. And fifteen percent is the average, which means that like it might feel for fifteen percent of the year like that's a hundred percent. Yep. But then for the other eighty-five percent of the year, it feels something different. It comes in different doses, and it has the ability to get you down. But you just got to think big picture. Yeah. So I did have, um, you know, kind of touching on a lot of what you had, um, a lot of what you had touched on there. But uh, a question from Kathy, and I only have one or two questions left, so um, I'm not going to keep you all to your afternoons, but Kathy says, what has been the highlight of your career thus far? Because you, know, you both talked into amazing achievements and things you've done, but what's kind of been a moment for you that you either of you thought, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing? Hmm. I'll speak to something that absolutely, I mean, I have to say that I've felt so many things have been highlights. So many things have been just wonderful moments, even though I tend to talk about a lot about the negative. So many things have been wonderful. And this isn't necessarily something I might answer tomorrow, but it just come to mind. Um, there was a there was a woman um, who who I was sent by another investor. I was sent their their pitch deck and their information to consider putting a hundred thousand dollars into this company. And I was thinking about it and looking at it. I was like, oh, this is actually really good. You know, I gotta I want to get some more information, do some more diligence. So had a phone call with the person. And they, so we were talking about $100,000, which is really hard for me to raise, you know, so it was a big deal. And so we were having a conversation and she said, she says, I don't know if you remember this, like halfway through, she's like, I don't know if you remember this, but one day online, you just started giving out like $200 stipends for people for their, for their businesses and for their this and that and the other. And that's, I tend to do that every once in a while, you know, maybe Christmas or maybe just, I just feel in that I have a nonprofit now that actually does that called cover. But at the time it was just one of these tweet storms. And she said, 
I won one of those. And that $200 was the reason I was able to keep this business going because it, it did this very specific thing that I needed in that moment, something, you know, cloud or something, you know, and I never got to tell you, but that's the reason I made it another year to even get to the point where I can be out raising $500,000 and you can look at. So I got more excited about that $200 than I ever would be about a hundred thousand, being able to say yes to a hundred thousand. That was like, I was giddy when I read that. I was like, mm -hmm. really? Like, that is so cool that, 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 that stuff is really making a difference, you know? <laughs> so it was moments like that where I understand it doesn't matter what anybody's saying at this point, as long as I'm trying to do no harm, which is part of my mantra. And as long as like every once in a while, um, someone gets a benefit like that, it's like so worth it. It's funny. You're such a condor or as your mom would say, <laughs> a seed. Um, because I, my, the first thing that came to mind, Sersha, when you asked that question um, on behalf of Kathy, was it? Yeah. Um, was that, uh, I'm only going to remember the most recent thing, right? And so the most recent sort of highlight, and like Arlen, there are so many. It's important to highlight the challenges because I don't want people to feel like they're alone. And a lot of people really do feel like this is only happening to them. But yeah, the highlights are so important and they are so frequent. Um, and the most recent one was, as I mentioned, uh, we built this ragtag group of people that were pre-qualifying these federal stimulus loans because black and brown business owners were being locked out. And so we had pulled favors with a bunch of people that we knew at different banks. Um, and one of them is a woman that's featured in LeapFrog. Um, she's in the chapter called Debt is Not a Four Little Word. She used to work at the Small Business Administration, the federal agency that focuses on small businesses in the US. And now she's at this bank called Live Oak. And she was the one that processed the most of these, um, even though like most banks, they were only processing people that they had existing lending relationships with, but they made exceptions for my people. And I made sure to only give her really, really well um, put together applications so that it was easier for them to process. And they didn't guarantee that they would, you know, give these people the loans, but they guaranteed me at least that a human being would look at them. And um, we had an amazing win rate with them. One of those women was a woman who is, um, she survived the civil war in Sierra Leone. Um, her name is Mariama Suma. And uh, while she was in Sierra Leone in her home, she became a registered nurse and then survives the civil war, immigrates to the United States. Um, it's just one of these extraordinary human beings. She lives outside of Philly. She started her own company with her husband. And now she has 150 employees that are home healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine during COVID, 150 employees who are out working with people in their homes and serving you know, them with indispensable healthcare needs. And she, of course, gets hit by the pandemic. Suddenly PPE, right? All of the things that she needs to do business is like exponentially more expensive. Um, she needs capital to survive and her bank of many years, TD Bank, just rejects her outright. Inexplicable, nobody understands why. She figures out a way to find a solution. Somehow she gets connected with me we hook her up with my friend at Live Oak Bank and we end up securing her uh, one of these federal loans for over 600K. It was the difference between life and death for her business, but also imagine all the people that her company serves, right? Mm -hmm. Predominantly black neighborhood outside of Philly, amazing, extraordinary human being, Mariama. Um, I get a friend of mine to feature her in Forbes because I wanna be sure that we're putting a face to the, you know, and a name to all these stories. Um, and I figure that's amazing. Like, as far as I'm concerned, we won, you know, we, we helped her, then we featured her in this beautiful story that went on Forbes. And then it turns out Poppy Harlow from CNN sees that article, decides to bring her on TV and have her tell her story. And again, I would have been over the moon happy that not only is Mariama, you know, her business is living to see another day. Uh, she got the capital she needed. She got some love on Forbes. Now she's going to get a spot on CNN with Poppy Harlow. I'm happy. And I coached her because she didn't have a lot of experience working with media just to make sure that she was going to do her very best on that show. And she did. Um, and without my prompting, and in fact, I had actually told her, you know, you have, you have very few minutes live, use them, you know, wisely and focus on these three or four things you want to say about your company. Think of it as a commercial. Um, she did all of those things. But then she had a little extra time. And in that extra time, she specifically used that time to both say my name, say Live Oak Bank, 
processed her loan and then also throw some shade at TD Bank and mention <laughs> them by name and say, you know, they rejected my loan. And when CNN said our producers talked to TD Bank and they're willing to reevaluate your loan application, oh. Mariama said, no, thanks. <laughs> We're all set. We got taken care of. And also I needed that money last month, not, you know, now. Anyway, it was just one of those moments where it was like everything came together to do what I wish we could do for millions mm. of Black women founders like Mariama, right? Um, and it isn't because, you know, as I think Arlen says at the beginning of her book, it isn't because Mariama is exceptional, even though I think she is. It's because there are millions of other Mariamas um, who need that edge, right? Who need that person mm -hmm. in their corner um, because the system is set up to exclude them. And it shouldn't be, she shouldn't need to be connected with me to help her get a loan that was, in, it was hers. Intended for her. Yeah. It was intended for her. She mm -hmm. shouldn't need back channel mm -hmm. special connections. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that was probably the highlight of the last many months. And I think that both of, everything that you both just said is such a wonderful note to end on because that is, such an inspiring message to get out to people that those, you know, people are doing work like you're doing and that is so worth it. So mm -hmm. I guess, you know, lastly, if you guys, if you want to tell us where to find your book, where to find you both, and I guess that we'll, we'll, we'll call it a day or an evening. As we said earlier, we don't know what time it is. <laughs> <laughs> what is time anymore, really? Uh, I know what day <laughs> it is doesn't it? Exist. <laughs> Ooh, it's about to be August. I'm happy to go first because my book should not be the last thought. It should be our list, which just published. Um, I'm very easy. You can go to leapfroghacks.com. Leapfrog because that's the name of the book and hacks because it's filled with 50 hacks. So leapfroghacks.com is where you can find everything about both my book and me. Yeah, same here. It's about damn time.com is a hub. You can find the book in many formats and you can find out more about what I do with Backstage Capital. Uh, investing and um, uh, find my podcast as well, Your First Million. So it's about damntime.com. Her podcast is amazing. Subscribe. Thank you. Do yourself a favor. <laughs> it was a pleasure to speak with both of you this evening. And congratulations, Ireland, on your book. I think it's such a recent publication. So congrats on that. And I wish you both the very best. Thank you so much for tuning in. And everybody who is watching from home and all the lovely comments and questions, thank you so much. Thanks, Sarah, for being a great host. <laughs>